Good morning, everybody. So, some of you are here because you're in a class, which is Migration in the Contemporary World in Environmental Science Policy Management and Ethnic Studies. If you're in that class, you'll get an awkward piece of paper, which is my way of trying to reuse paper from the presentation about um, political, economic, and social inequalities related to health in New Mexico two weeks ago. So get a little piece of paper to write the your GSI, your name, and a question you have for uh, Professor Gaspar Lida de Salgado, who we're honored to have here today. Um, so this week and last week, we've been talking about indigeneity in relation to immigration. Um, we, we met a uh, family, a couple of families who came, uh, if you were here last Tuesday, we talked about their experience of migration and their experience of farm work and of health. Um, if you were with us on Thursday, um, we talked with Dean some about my research related to this, but there also was a car on so people were able to come. And then on Tuesday, which was Indigenous Peoples Day, um, we met people from the Invisible uh, Fama who have been working resisting the U.S. border militarization um, and working to empower their people and other Native people along the border. So today we are honored to have Gaspar Vigreta Salgado, who is currently project director at the UCLA Center for Labor Research and Education, where he teaches classes on work, labor, and social justice in the US and on immigration issues. He also directs the Institute for Transnational Social Change. He currently serves as an advisor to several migrant organizations in California and in Mexico, including the Fresno-based Binational Center for Oaxacan Indig Indigenous Development, which if I get warmer, I'll take my sweater off and you'll see the shirt from the Binational Center. Also the Binational Front of Indigenous Organizations and the Oaxaca-based Desarrollo Binacional Integral Indica. Um, and it's an honor for me to have Gaspar here also because he is one of my official and unofficial mentors in research and in research related to indigenous immigration especially. So please welcome that part. Also, just so you know, there's a class at UC Davis that wanted to hear Gaspar. So um, CB in the back is videotaping Gaspar's lecture and slides so that the people at Davis can watch it. You say. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes. Um, using the microphone is kind of funny because I have to control myself. I can't hear shout and be very loud, so I have to moderate my voice now. It's great to be here, especially uh, in Seth's class, um, because I really admire the work that Seth is doing, especially, I don't know if you. I think you're using his book uh, in this class, so it's a wonderful um, story um, about uh, the many things that I've been studying for the last uh, 20 years. And so I want to cover two things in this lecture. One, I want to build on um, the main premises from that reading and provide you with uh, what I hope is a container uh, from which we can, we can start thinking about uh, this uh, big population, the immigrant population uh, that has come to the United States uh, in the most recent decades. But especially, I'm interested in opening up uh, the black box of what we call Mexican migration and Mexicanness. And, and hopefully by the end of the, of the first half of the presentation, I can persuade you that uh, Mexican migration is a multiracial, multilingual process. And if we realize that, then what to do next? How can we then start uh, working as allies with this population and its uh, multiple uh, people there. And in the second half of the lecture, I'm hoping to present some of the applied work that I've been doing with uh, immigrants. 
because I think that we have a responsibility, especially being standing here in this public university, it's a land grant university. We are on indigenous territory, so we have to acknowledge first uh, the ancestors of the original peoples uh, that inhabit these lands. But also, I'm very happy to be here uh, in Berkeley, very close to the indigenous people day because this was the first city in California actually to move from celebrating Columbus Day on October 12th to celebrate the indigenous people day. So there's a there's an important history, and, and this history was important because Los Angeles two years ago moved, uh, so had a debate. Um, a city hall uh, that uh, switched the celebration of Columbus Day to Indigenous you know, People Day. And it was a very hot, hotly, uh, hotly contested debate uh, because there were very strong feelings on the one hand of the people who thought that Columbus Day provided with visibility in um, a public space of recognition for the contribution of Italian Americans who had also suffered a lot of discrimination as uh, coming on that way as the late 1800s from Southern Europe, and there was a lot of prejudice against them. So they struggled very hard for that recognition, and they were claiming that uh, Columbus Day provided them with that public recognition. And on the other hand, indigenous people, especially Combas and uh, Gabrielenos, who were the original people in LA, wanted to address the issue of this invisibility of the indigenous population. You know, they, they said that, well, one thing is to be mistreated and to experience prejudice, but how about experiencing invisibility? Nobody sees you. And everybody comes into your space and you're not at all. So in a way, that's a good metaphor to what I'm gonna discuss, because this is so the same issue that happens when we try to understand uh, diversity from the very popular version of diversity that we have in the United States, where uh, you know we learn that the United States is a diverse society, is a mosaic, uh, is a big mosaic composed of different spaces, and each people who come to this country sort of has a little square in that kind of mosaic. And therefore, when you see the aggregation of all these people, you can see the pattern of diversity. So I'd like to, to roll with us. So who represents the Mexicans in that mosaic, right? Who are these people? Because I think that's a debate that is currently happening also in, in Mexico and here. Uh, and we have what we call a paradox in terms of when we think about indigenous people. So I know that uh, you've gone over this concept in this class, and I know that uh, maybe you know that one of the definitions of indigenous and indigenous people is that when we talk about indigenous people in the context of Mexico, we're referring to the population that was there before the arrival of the Spaniards. Before uh, the Spaniards arrived to this place, especially uh, West Central Mexico, uh, where there was a region that we call Mesoamerica, there was a huge concentration of people there, uh, all the way from the central valleys in Mexico uh, to Guatemala to Honduras and El Salvador. And they were close to uh, 15, 16 million people living there. So this place was full of uh, vibrancy and thriving cultures. And currently, if you go to Mexico, you can immediately notice how this legacy uh, is kind of uh, um, being questioned. On the one hand, there's a lot of pride in Mexico about the indigenous past. You can even buy and book a tour to these indigenous places in southern Mexico. One of the main attractions in Mexico is a tour of the Mayan Riviera. You can explain uh, Mayan culture. You can go and, and know about the glorious past, especially in the archaeological sites 
of the Mayans, where you can have their rock concerts, light concerts like these ones. They light up the pyramids at night for you. So you can see and experience uh, sort of the, the, uh, the presence of the great civilization. So that's great. It is great to celebrate that. It's great to think that Mexico has this uh, past that is glorious and is full of their civilization. On the other hand, what to do with leading indigenous people in Mexico? So to, last year there was a presidential election in Mexico. Um, and um, uh, there was a very strong candidate running on the left to center ticket, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador who actually won in a landslide, over 60% of the population voted for him. Uh, for the first time since voting history, maybe since the Cardinals administration in the United States would have a center-leftist government. But it was interesting because it was the first time that the electoral system in Mexico would open up as well, uh, to citizen independent candidates. Candidates that were not affiliated with a political party. And that was interesting because the indigenous movement in Mexico, uh, who you know, uh, took up arms on January 1st, 1994, uh, with the goal to change the relationship between indigenous people and the Mexican government, they started a national movement last year to, uh, to qualify an indigenous Nahuatl woman to be on the ticket on the election. So that was. On the one hand, that was a part of it because a lot of people celebrated. That's great that finally uh, an indigenous woman of Nava descent uh, could be on the ticket. There were several obstacles that you have to overcome in order to become an independent candidate. You have to gather a million signatures of voters, and these signatures have to be uh, from 19 states from Mexico. So that was a big challenge. And during her campaign, she was very savvy about using social media. So she had a, of course, like everybody, she was tweeting, she had a Facebook uh, page and uh, Instagram. And it was interesting to read the comments that she got uh, in her uh, Facebook page. This is last year. And a lot of people would support her, a lot of people would praise her. But also there were thousands and thousands of racist comments against her. And the comments were very typical, like, uh, what is an indigenous woman running for president? An Indian woman belongs in the kitchen. Right? It's interesting because it was very hurtful too if you're of indigenous descent. You realize that this discrimination is deeply embedded in the psyche in actually a culture of Mexican. If you how many <coughs> speak Spanish? Some of you, so many you have heard this term. <laughs> if you want to insult somebody, if you go to Mexico and you want to insult somebody, all you have to say is no says indio. Do not act like an Indian. So if you're shy, if you are kind of um, um, uh, not very refined, the people you say, but you're acting like an Indian. This is very interesting. Because on the one hand, we had the glorious past, right? On the one hand, we had the celebration of these great civilizations. We have a national anthropological museum that sort of celebrates that past. And on the other hand, there's thriving racism to the point where it has become part of our everyday dialogue. So another insult, and this is interesting because um, being an Indian is such an insult that uh, this same language and um, values are being transported by people migrating here. So uh, I'm going to show you a slide later about high school students in Oxford. Uh, indigenous my kids who went home crying every day because they were called inditos, guajitas. People have learned how to insult them. So I think and there are others. And another one that I'm very interested in is this, um, this uh, other popular saying, other phrase that is mejora la raza. Uh, 
uh, you better improve your race. And it's interesting because um, it's a process of whiteness. Um, and that is very relevant because when I was doing research about how uh, Latinos, Hispanics, and Mexican migrants uh, navigate the racial uh, maze that we have here in the United States, it was interesting to find out that close to 70% of Mexicans in the census uh, checked uh, white in the US census. So if you look at the numbers, you always have to look at the numbers, especially if you want to know about the white population, you have to disaggregate it. One part you can see everybody that uh, identifies as white, and then you can disaggregate the numbers and find out uh, uh, how many Jews are uh, Hispanic Latinos and cross-reference that with, with uh, white. And, and of course, you have limited choices in the United States without five official races, so there's not you know, many places where you think, oh, but that's interesting to me. Because in Mexico, this is, it has a whole history, this issue about race and uh, whitening, because it's a legacy of the colonial period. And we still live with that. In the colonial period, the, the policy was that everybody belonged to one of the different castes that the, the Spaniards had developed, implemented, and policed, actually, during the colonial period. And, and the whole point was to, to better the race, you would widen the population. So, you know, the majority of the population in Mexico is called mestizo. They're the son and daughters, or the white product of a Spaniard and an indigenous uh, person. So if you believe in few races, this is really uh, taking it to extremes, right? Because they believe actually in the percentage of purity. So the majority of this species population now is the dominant population in Mexico. But if you want to whiten, a mestizo could marry a Spaniard, and they could become a castizo, which was one the step up. And if you are a castizo, you can marry again a Spaniard, and then you can become finally a Spanish, a Spaniard, a Spaniard. But if you were a mestizo, and you marry somebody darker, you were a Santa Patras, a step back. And actually, it was literally a classification in the racialized system of the colonial period. So when people talk about mejor la raza, it means to become white and to stop being Indian. And this is still uh, used widely uh, in Mexico, throughout Mexico, but also throughout the uh, Mexican uh, immigrant population here in the United States. So this is used to, to, um, to frame the, some of the challenges of how we have to start conceptualizing the diversity within the Mexican okay. Latino community. Okay. What is unique about the experience of these indigenous people that are crossing the border and are becoming part of the Mexican enclaves that we have throughout California? Uh, how do we explain uh, their experience? Um, and of course, uh, there's a lot of information in this PowerPoint. I'm going to go very quickly and stop in the main points. And also, I want you, since you have some knowledge about this, because this has been at the center also of, of this class, I want you to stop me and ask me questions um, so that we can engage in our dialogue. So let me use, um, set, um, I don't know, maybe you, you know about this. So you know that one of the um, indicators of diversity, cultural diversity, is uh, languages that are spoken in a given place. Do you know how many languages are spoken in Mexico? Take a guess, and it can be from one, of course we know that they speak Spanish, to a hundred. How many languages do you think are spoken in Mexico? In Mexico is a very diverse country, linguistically. Can you guess how many languages? Uh -huh. Like we have more, more. Oh, that's a good guess. A little bit less. Uh -huh. Very good guess. A little bit less. Uh -huh. Very hot. 68. 68. So this is interesting because I think the same exercise 
when I go uh, lecture in Mexico City, Oaxaca City, and it's interesting. Yeah, lots of people in Mexico don't know this fact. And it's interesting because all you have to do is Google it. You say, Siri, how many languages are spoken in Mexico? And then, boom! <laughs> And I show you a map. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of information there. So this Mexico is one of the most diverse countries in, 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 in the Americas. Actually, it's the country with the largest indigenous population in the Americas. In terms of shared numbers, not in terms of percentages, places like Ecuador, Bolivia, and Guatemala have higher percentages of indigenous people within the border. In fact, there are smaller countries. There are 120 million Mexicans living in that country. And depending on how you count, they can be anywhere from 8 to 22 million people. And we'll discuss a little bit about the politics of classifying people. If you can be an Indian, and you cannot be an Indian. And by the way, I'm using Indians in quotation because we just uh, you know, mark the 528th, uh, 27th anniversary of Columbus um, arrival to the Americas, and we had an interesting workshop, and said was in Fresno, and we were talking about where the term Indian comes from, and it comes from this, from the mistake that Christopher Columbus made, thinking that he was sending to India, on the other side of the continent, and not knowing that there was a whole continent in the middle. So in order to keep his funding, from the king of Spain, he started lying to them. and said, guess what, king of Spain and queen of Spain? I have lied to India. And all these inhabitants that I've been controlling are Indians. So it was a terrible historical mistake that still comes the Indian population today. So they thought that was kind of funny. Um, but this population is well and thriving. In LA is one of the places with the largest concentration of indigenous population, not only from Mexico, but other parts of the world. It's so large that uh, uh, during the summer when uh, the Mexican government was holding uh, regional forums to get the feedback from the indigenous community about changes that Congress is going to propose to the Mexican Constitution to recognize the rights of indigenous people, they had to hold, they had to organize a forum in Los Angeles because there were so many other people there that they had to do it. So this is, a, this is the forum that happened there. And of course, Ale being the, the, the site of the largest uh, indigenous uh, population, even the library sort of has to celebrate that. And that's our murals at the Central Library with a very interesting term on the corner. I don't know if you can read it. Can you tell me what that says on the upper corner of the mural? Oaxaca, California. It's this imaginary concept of how of the closeness of the of how connected these indigenous communities in Oaxaca, one state in Mexico. In, in California. So it's an imaginary space where there's a lot of ideas flowing, a lot of uh, tradition, money, people. And, and, and this is the space where these indigenous people reproduce a sense of belonging and their culture. And that's the gathering at the Labor Center. And then out of those folks that were participating in the forum in LA, there was a delegation of four people who went from LA to the National Congress in, uh, in uh, this just happened in, in August. Uh, so we were gathering uh, at the Nantan Labor Center on August 4th, and that picture was taken on August 6th in Mexico City, continuing the dialogue about changes in the electric constitution. So one of the arguments is that how important it is uh, the, the incorporation of this population to the affairs of Mexico and their communities even outside of the Mexican, of the territory of Mexico. Of course, also, Ale is the home of the largest Mayan community. So you see a lot of uh, uh, expressions of Mayan culture. There is a uh, Mayan taco truck um, uh, in, in certain parts of, of the city. There are uh, exhibits. You see women on the streets. On Alvarado in little Central America, walking with their with pilas. 
So uh, that is uh, a very important process. I'm not going to talk about that, but I think as a reference, it's important to also think that the indigenous community is diverse. It's not uh, also homogeneity. So let me focus a little bit on the um, on how we can start challenging how we think about issues of diversity, especially racial and ethnic diversity within the Latino and the Mexican community. Um, and I think one way, uh, let me see, do I have a poster, you know? If there's a poster, a laser? So, as we know, California is uh, where the largest concentration of uh, Latinos are, and of course, in the politics of identity, Mexicans. Um, it's interesting how you add identities when you cross the border, right? Uh, I'm Mexican, I'm Mixteco, I'm from Oaxaca. I didn't know I was Latino Hispanic until I crossed the border. So, <laughs> you cross the border, and all of a sudden you have to fill out all these forms. And it's okay, what are you? Mexican, what are you? None of that was so before. You have to say that it's a Latino Hispanic. And this is a unique um, description of this population created in the United States. Nothing else. Nowhere else. Uh, people from Latin America call themselves Latino Hispanic. Only there. And of course, it was created by the census bureau to classify, and it wasn't a racial category, it was a linguistic cultural category, because, you know, Hispanic, Latinos, all these immigrants from Central America, Mexico, and the Caribbean were coming into the United States. And the state needs to classify the population. They were going crazy. How can we talk about this population? How can we develop programs? How can we develop policy if we don't have a classification process? So it was, it's a and all the racial labels are actually created, political driven creation. So, so it's interesting that as a uh, as an immigrant, you have to start navigating that. So you have to, for Latinos, is okay. You have to decide you're Latino, Hispanic. Then you choose your country of origin, and then is the racial question that creates an existential crisis for you because then you have to say, what race are you? And you start reading uh, white. African American, uh, Native American, uh, 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 Pacific Islander, or Hawaiian. And it's like, hmm. And now they added older, right? You can create your own race if you want to now. You can write it there. It is interesting because a lot of people are doing that. A lot of uh, organizations of indigenous migrants are saying, well, we don't fit here. Why don't we say we're Hispanic, Latino, we're Mexican? And then when we say so, then we put Mixteco. Sapoteco, tricky. It is interesting because the census is now, if you look at the census, there are few cases of people that have marked in other their own ethnic background with the name of their Indian community. But in large part, the census used, uh, classifies the people by race and then they desegregate the Latinos from whites. So uh, if you can see here, for example, the, uh, the, uh, the population uh, uh, in California is uh, 48% uh, in the county of Los Angeles, and then um, in, um, in, um, in, uh, in LA is also 48%. So we tend to think about diversity within this community by uh, just thinking about um, national of origin, right? Latinos and, and Hispanics are diverse because they come from very different countries. They can come from El Salvador, they can come from Cuba. And it's interesting because you mix immigrants with non-immigrants, Puerto Ricans, you know, uh, they're part of the United States. They're citizens when they move to mainland. But since part of this Commonwealth territory, uh, they don't count. Uh, but these indigenous migrants, especially from Mexico, especially from Guatemala, are part of this demographic revolution that occurred in the United States during the 19, uh, late 1980s, especially in the 1990s. There was a massive exodus from Latin America, especially from Mexico and Central America, 
coming to the United States. And that completely changed the populations of states and cities, like in the area and like California. If you look at this uh, graph, how in the 1980s, before this massive exodus, uh, Latinos and Hispanics were only 6% of the national population. But they were like people in even Tacos were not part of the American diet. But by 20, uh, 1920, 2020, we have surpassed the, uh, the 40 million. And it is estimated by the census that by 2060, full 128 million, or 30% of the population will be elected in this time part. Speak about that. This is, of course, this is good news and bad news. So people are going to celebrate, right? Hey, you can travel anywhere in the United States and dance salsa, have your lengua burritos, and you're fine. But other people are going to say, there goes the neighborhood. And we're going to one of those debates, actually, right, in the United States about what is, how should we think about immigration? So if we get the a part of this way, impacting and transforming the United States, and I think it, Anywhere, as you look at it, these numbers are huge. So you would better then understand the nuances of this population. And because also uh, a lot of this uh, population speaks Spanish, so if you put together all the uh, Spanish-speaking people in the United States, they become the second largest country, and in 2016, the largest country that would supply the population of Mexico. So this is a big population. It comes from many different countries, and it has different um, uh, uh, compositions in different regions of the United States, right? So you can see how um, in, in the Southern California region, uh, Mexico <coughs> dominates these, um, uh, the Latino Hispanic population. But you go in other places, like uh, New York, Miami is very noticeable. The culture is very different, and that would be Cuban. Uh, and uh, in New York, that would be Puerto Ricans. And in the Washington region, then it's uh, more even out uh, with, uh, with uh, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, but also a huge proportion of Salvadorans. So you can see how the flavor of Latinidad is, uh, uh, is very different in, in different regions. So let's think about that because that's one way to start understanding diversity within the Latino, the Mexican community. What are the other ways in which we can uh, start thinking about this? So we can start opening up those national identities and look inside. The process of creation of these nations in Latin America was a violent process. And they had to create a notion uh, and a national identity out of many people. And this was this was the case for Mexico and the indigenous population. Actually, Mexico had the largest indigenous population of the arrival of the Spaniard. And just now, more than 200 years uh, later, that population is uh, at the same numbers that they were before the conquest. And you can see a map there of Mexico of how different it looks when you put on the map indigenous speaking population. So you have here the 68 groups. And actually, Mexico is going through a transformation. You can find a lot of resources about, about this population in many different places. So for example, there, there have been some campaigns about translating, finally, some of the uh, election materials to indigenous um, uh, languages. Um, um, of course, this is a huge challenge because a lot of these indigenous languages are, uh, um, are oral languages. Many of them, of course, have, uh, uh, have been, uh, uh, are written, like the Mayan language, but others uh, develop a pictorial um, way of writing books, and these are the codices. But, uh, but in general, most of these languages are <coughs> oral in, um, uh, in nature. So you can see then uh, even the government has really supported a lot 
the National Institute of Indigenous Languages. And if you want to know more about languages, I have, I'm going to give this presentation to, uh, to Seth, so maybe if you're interested, maybe you can post it in the class website. And at the end of my presentation, I have resources if you're interested about languages, culture, history. I have some sites, but this is a very interesting site, the Institute for National Indigenous Languages, because it gives you the breakdown. And actually, things get more complicated, because traditionally, we classify the languages as if they were um, um, homogeneous things, right? Mixtecos is speaking Mixteco, Tricky is speaking Tricky, right? It turns out that it is not okay to call them uh, language, but there are a family of languages because there are variations, especially within the largest uh, uh, languages. And so if you look at the, um, at the top uh, 10 languages, Especially, for example, using the Mayan uh, uh, language, I mean, it, there as one language, but actually there are 23 different types of Maya. And actually, San Francisco, the Bay Area, is one of the sites of migration for this Maya, for a lot of the Maya population. But the Maya population uh, comes not only from the peninsula of Yucatan, from uh, Quintana Roo, from especially Chiapas which is the border state where the Zapatistas took up arms, and most of the Zapatista um, um, uh, members are from uh, the Mayan-speaking communities here. But also you have Guatemala right here. And these, uh, these lines were said artificially, the Mayan communities go back and forth between these territories. So used within Mayan, you have so many different uh, uh, languages and variations. One of the largest, it sets out, actually, with close to half a million uh, speakers for that. It's, it's as big as the Mixteco. Uh, and Mixteco also has close to 80 different uh, dialects or variations. So you can see how um, even starting uh, uh, thinking about uh, uh, languages, we immediately are posing each other of huge variations. So this is the whole list, if you're interested, all the different languages, 68 languages. Um, what's interesting though is, given the fact that it's very well recognized that Mexico was one of those sites where uh, indigenous people gave, gave great contribution to the world. I mean, this is where corn was domesticated. This is where uh, 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 writing systems were developed, great cities. It's interesting to, to pay attention to the politics of uh, identity in Mexico. Um, who's indigenous and who can claim to be an indigenous population? That has always been a source of conflict uh, and debate within Mexico. For a long time, Mexico wanted to become part of, of the industrialized world, of the civilized world, so they tended to minimize the uh, number of indigenous populations. Actually, when they were defining some of the most pressing social problems that Mexico was uh, facing, they would say that the Indian problem was one of the toughest. How to incorporate the so-called Indians into mainstream population. And they started, since the 1930s, a process of, uh, of uh, through education, uh, Mexicanize all these indigenous people. So instead of developing bilingual systems of uh, the public education, in the 1930s after the Mexican Revolution, Mexico started what they called an uh, um, indigenista policy, and that was a process of incorporation, of assimilation, forced assimilation of these indigenous people. It's not until very recently that Mexico has loosened up and has come to terms with the fact that, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of um, indigenous people in Mexico that embrace them. And one way to do that is to start saying, okay, in the past, we have defined indigenous people, not in terms of racial terms, but in terms of language use. So anyone, uh, when the census taker, they said it comes so when you responded to the census, the census would, would ask you, do you speak an indigenous language? And if you were five years or older, and you spoke an indigenous language, you were classified 
and only then as indigenous. But if you were in an indigenous community and your parents spoke an indigenous language, but because you went to school and you didn't speak indigenous languages, you were no longer considered indigenous. Which is kind of silly, right? This is a part of the community. But anyway, with that way of counting people, the numbers are very low. Because you really are only consider, considering uh, uh, speakers of the language that are older. Uh, they open, finally open it up, and they allow for self identification. So in the last census, they ask if you consider yourself indigenous. Not that if you speak a language. If you assume yourself an indigenous identity, the numbers went way up. Whereas in 2015, there were 7.2 million of people who spoke indigenous uh, and indigenous that way, there were uh, 25.6 <coughs> million Mexicans who self-identified as indigenous. So the, the, the official number of the indigenous population in Mexico is 6.6, .6, but now with the self-identification has gone to 21%. And you can see the politics here, right? Why is this so problematic? Why is this a source of contention? So I think that is a very interesting field, actually, to yeah. inquire, to sort of start thinking about that. And, um, and I think um, <coughs> what I would say is that it's still very political charge to be um, um, indigenous. So let me, let me move very quickly to some of the specific challenges. And I'm gonna the background that you have it because you met even some um, um, uh, migrants from the Triki region, and maybe you're familiar with this map. Oaxaca is one of the most um, racially diverse the states within Mexico. Using Oaxaca itself, you have 16 uh, um, original uh, nations, and uh, the largest one, of course, are the Zapotecs. Uh, in this. Uh, some color and they expand. This is the Sierra Norte, the Central Valley in the Sierra Sur. This is the side of the Mixtecos, the purple. Um, uh, in the red, the, this is the region where Trikis come from. So it's an enclave within uh, Mixteco territory. So uh, maybe you know, you, you, you know. But let me move quickly to then how we can start thinking about uh, uh, diversity within the Latino population. And I think one thing that we need to acknowledge then is the, the presence, the historical presence of a racial hierarchy that shapes uh, values, that shapes uh, cultural um, behaviors, and that shapes then the place of indigeneity and indigenous people within these uh, racial hierarchy, and of course, within the racial hierarchy that developed during the colonial period, indigenous people are at the bottom of the totem pole. But not only that, those cultural values are transferred and transformed into justifications for poverty, class exploitation, and, and also the amount of uh, 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 money that is invested into maintaining indigenous language and indigenous uh, culture. And of course, this is the slide that I wanted to show you. This is the, the slides of the caste system developed in the, um, in the colonial period. And you can see how um, it was pedagogical. You wanted to teach people their place in society. And so these were actually part of large uh, paintings that were displayed in public spaces. And it clearly state the racial hierarchy that the, uh, the Spanish uh, um, uh, implemented in Mexico and here. Here you have the different, um, because of course this is one way of looking at race in, um, uh, um, as, as pure races, as, you know, that they would argue that there's such a thing as a pure race and that um, um, it was part of the, the origins of a genetics way before that was assigned. And you can see that the main goal was to go from Mestizo, Castizo, to Espanol if you marry white. But if you marry with somebody dark, then you will 
salta para atrás, right? He went back and down with his racial hierarchy. The argument then, this is a long way to say that the way we interact, the way we behave, the way the types of work that we do is within the context of this long historical development. So uh, when we are interacting, then we bring who we are, this long and better histories in our mind into better. And this is exactly what happens then with, uh, with indigenous people. And I'm gonna sort of start wrapping up this part so I can uh, go on to what to do with all this knowledge. Uh, there are two specific challenges that I think uh, um, uh, indigenous people face in the of migration. And, and, and one is this um, very bad timing in terms of migration. <laughs> Because if you start coming after the uh, late 1980s and 1990s, so the, the, the market had been cornered by previous immigrants. And also, you didn't qualify for the amnesty program of the 1986 ILCA program. That was the last time there was a legalization process where undocumented people could fix their papers. If you came after that, tough luck. So you were a newcomer taking the worst paid job, the most physically challenging job, and also you were undocumented. So there were a lot of things in that context that were negative. On top of that, people thought of you as less off. And so this, is, this was reproduced in communities here, and this is the case of the Oldsner Unified School District, where, uh, where there's a war here, right? There's racial prejudice or bullying, and these uh, Oaxaqueño kids were being called Oaxaquita, or little Oaxacan, and, 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 and it's a, it used in a pejorative way. And it's interesting because what they did is they organized. They sort of activate some of these social networks because also we cannot think of these indigenous migrants as so marginalized, so dispossessed, that they cannot be agents of social change. It's, inter it's, a, it's another paradox. It is within this community that they have formed very interesting and solid uh, social networks and political organizations. Um, so in the case of Oxnard, these kids actually organize in high school and in middle school. They partner with a local nonprofit organization and they start a campaign uh, of trying to address this issue with the school board in Oxnard. They actually uh, uh, won uh, as, uh, to change some of the internal policies uh, where everybody was going to undergo uh, cultural sensitivity training from the teachers, from the administrators, and also they were going to incorporate this curriculum in the classroom. And this is interesting because this is sort of an example of how people organizing can change as so their situation. And of course, the other major problem is that when you are from Mexico, even if you're indigenous people, when you come to places like California, everybody thinks that you speak Spanish, right? Because it's, it's the natural thing to do. You're dark hair, brown skin, you come from Mexico. What happens if you speak Spanish? Right? It's a big challenge because the entire infrastructure to support and help Mexican immigrants is built up on the assumption that everybody is actually like speaking Spanish. And when that assumption doesn't work, there are some very tight consequences. And uh, it's all the challenges then that some of these uh, organizers face is that, you know, they deal with these uh, examples of uh, where not speaking Spanish have very tragic consequences. Right? And there's um, the tragic example, the first one, of, um, um, of a tricky man who, you know, he was, um, he was a farm worker. He wasn't homeless, but he, um, um, he spent a lot of time in the streets. He was um, uh, urinating in public. The police came. And they were supposedly bilingual officers. And, and, and they were asking questions, and the bank wouldn't speak, or wouldn't give answers. So the officer 
Instead of thinking, oh, maybe he doesn't speak Spanish. He thought, there's something wrong with this guy. Right? Or that, maybe, how do you react? And then social services, and then you have the consequences. And there are many other examples of, 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 of that. So what to do then? What if we know that what are the potential responses to these? And I think, especially um, we in public universities, in this, um, um, in this place of privilege, we have a responsibility to start thinking, how can we be allies? How, what is the role of universities and students in sort of uh, uh, start addressing some of the challenges that these immigrants are uh, facing? Uh, is another PowerPoint here? Okay, let me. Um, and I'm going to go very quickly because are there any questions when we're transitioning? Any? There's a lot more information, but um, anything that seems confusing? Maybe? No? Of course. I just want to changing the slides. Um, I want to point out that uh, Professor Rivera Salgado is one of the founding members of the Binational Center for the Development of Indigenous Walking Communities and one of the founding members of the Binational Front of Indigenous Organizations. And he was one of the organizers of the Foro Binacional where the Mexican president had asked to get advice from indigenous communities. The other thing I should say is that there were so many groups excited that he was coming to Berkeley from UCLA that his visit today was sponsored by the Big Ideas course, the Department of Environmental Science Policy Management, the Department of Ethnic Studies, the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society, the Joseph Myers Center for Research on Native American Issues, the Center for Race and Gender in Native American Studies, Chicanx Latinx Student Development Office, I think I saw the up there. Um, the Latinx Center of Excellence, the Center for Latin American Studies, and the Berkeley Interdisciplinary Migration Initiative. So, um, we're all so excited. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, let's see. So, I think that it can be very overwhelming just to think about all the problems that different people face in the world, right? And it's like, okay, where do we start? How can I help? And I think, um, for me, I mean, the question is complicated, but it's not. We learn a lot about radical ideas in places like this, in Berkeley, right? We read a lot of books. And pretty soon we start thinking, what should I do with all this knowledge, with all this education? What is it? How can I apply it? And many people are very practical, right? Go to computer science, they were recruited by Google, and you have it made. For other people, it's a little bit complicated because we want to change the world. I mean, we want to make this a, a more just world, which is a little bit more of a challenge. Uh, where do we start? So I think we start with basic questions about the, the role of university, about what does it mean to work uh, and really be engaged with uh, social justice. Do intellectuals, do academics contribute anything to that? Who are the ones who produce knowledge? Because sometimes we forget, right, that uh, we, can, we, we can think and maybe, uh, and that's not my message, but by outlining all the challenges that the of people face, you might think, oh, poor people. They're so marginalized, they're so poor, they're so exploited. On the other hand, there's a lot of historical knowledge there. And I think we need to really start questioning uh, that process of knowledge pro uh, uh, production and knowledge uh, uh, appropriation. And I would, I would really encourage you to use the radical ideas that you're learning. I mean, all the question of how to transform the world really starts as an idea, right? It starts with critical thinking. And there are so many books to read. There's so many places uh, to go there, but especially, I mean, I've been shaped by a lot of these uh, books where if you read it, you go, well, that makes sense. And it's not only in the United States, right? so there's a large literature, especially around social justice and indigenous movements in Latin America, that is very exciting. So there's, uh, for example, what 
What will the indigenous people do if they take over the power of the state? That's a very interesting question. And it happened in Bolivia. Right with the election of Evo Morales. So, okay. If, if indigenous people have a different proposal to change the world, then look at that. How far is it going with Evo Morales in, 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 in Bolivia, right? Uh, how, um, how are the transformations? Um, how can we, and this is a big uh, movement led by indigenous intellectuals and indigenous people, how can we, as indigenous people, stop thinking of ourselves from the perspective of the colonized? How can we free our minds and our thought from that colonial legacy that was imposed? But also, how can we walk a line where we're not just thinking of ourselves as oppressed people, but also we don't become oppressors? Is there a way to do that? So there are very interesting questions that these indigenous movements are posing, and I think there's a lot of inspiration. But then you have to take all these ideas, and then you have to interact with the real people. That's your reality check, right? After going uh, from a reading, a band reading seminar at Berkeley, how do you talk to ordinary people, right? And how do you expose and have a conversation about those ideas out there in the community? And I think that, that for me, has been very nurturing. And I started, you know, uh, very young when I was an undergraduate student uh, in Mexico City, and also here at, at UC Santa Cruz. And, um, and, um, and so these ideas about uh, decolonization, radical social movements, uh, uh, those were the ideas that gave rise to some of the radical political indigenous organizations. One of them was the Binational Indigenous Front that was created among indigenous migrants in 1991 because there was a huge debate in the entire Americas about the 500 years of resistance, of indigenous resistance. So the indigenous, we call it the 500 years of indigenous resistance, and the government were celebrating the 500 years of the discovery of the Americas. So as part of that, as part of that engagement with the communities, uh, you know, a set of us used our migratory networks to reach back to our communities of origin. So we were not only marching, there was in uh, October 1992, a reproduction of the original uh, uh, ships that were going to be coming to the San Francisco Bay. It, a lot of indigenous organizers converged in San Francisco to sort of practice that. And some of us went to Oaxaca and organized the indigenous community there. And we took over the archaeological sites. Like this is Monte Alban outside uh, Mexico City. And it was so fascinating when you break the rules, right? Here you have these archaeological sites, and they're run by the government, by the National Institute of History and Archaeology. And they charge you money. And if you want a tour, they charge you extra money. So it's interesting that, um, you know, a few hundred indigenous people from Oaxaca show up on October 12, 1992, to Monte Alban, and it's like, here we are. We want, to go, we want to see our house. The guards didn't know what to do with that. Should we charge them? They want to call the police. It's like, don't worry, we'll take care of this. And, and it was fascinating because they had a, we, had a, we had a march and a teaching inside the archaeological site. And it was used, it was used um, a public manifestation of we're taking over. We are the owners of this history, and we want to be here. We have the right to be here. So this has translated into a lot of uh, um, community educational uh, project. And for few, this is the decolonization project. So uh, since 1992, that's one of the main ways in which they organize, actually, communities. They go into a community, and they say, can we talk about the history of indigenous people. And they use a lot of the young people who have gone to universities, who have read books, to facilitate those workshops. So there is a role for that. And they're the ones who are bilingual or trilingual. And they're the ones who are telling this story. 
Uh, so and that has transformed into, um, and these workshops take place throughout California, from um, Napa Valley to the Central Valley, from Stockton to Beckerfield, all the way to places like uh, North County, San Diego. And sometimes, of course, the speakers are boring, but the food, but the food is good. <laughs> and you want to make sure that you put a good picture of a nice hot pozole. And sometimes I love the food because the organizing, to organize women, you don't call them, you don't, you don't invite them to a decolonization workshop, right? You invite them, teach us about the traditional dishes. How is it that you cook traditional dishes, the, the per-Hispanic dishes, and they come, and they're the ones leading these, they do it in Mixteco, Triti, Zapoteco, and they're teaching the United States version. It's a decolonization workshop. But it's interesting that not only it's about food, but also the reading, the codices, the books, the pictographic books that uh, they uh, develop. And that's how they are, in front of them, very active, and they ask for a very specific training, right? So they ask your professor self also to come and do a training about the work that he does. Sometimes, in April this year, it was the 100th anniversary of the um, assassination of Emiliano Zapata. I don't know if you know that, but that was a key moment, so they wanted to have a workshop on the legacy of the Miguel Zapata. So these are fun workers, and they think of these spaces really as uh, La Universidad del Pueblo, the People's University. And they invite a lot of speakers, they have, and these are you know, families that go there. And so that's one way I think that uh, they uh, have maintained and fostered uh, uh, the organization, they, this is the places where they pass down their history, and this is the places where also they uh, uh, socialize and politicize uh, the new uh, leaders. And this is the case of another organization, a news organization in Oxford. Actually, they have called their project uh, Universidad del Pueblo. And they want a leadership school, and they asked me to do a series of uh, workshops to, to talk about the history of organizing farm workers, because all of these are farm workers, and, and they're very interested in forming uh, a, a farm worker center and building on the history of organizing of the United Farm Workers. So these are, uh, you know, farm workers who show up on Thursday night right after work to learn about the history of organizing. And they're the ones who organize them. Like they all they call different people. They noticed that I was teaching a class on organized home workers. They we need you to come here and, and teach things. So I'm like, okay, I'll be happy to do that. And, and they were so serious that they even had diplomas at the end. They had a, a graduation. Also, other organizations such as the Binational Center and and, and Seth uh, is uh, wearing that shirt is the stand on proper organization. They're an advocacy organization. And actually, they need to teach non-profit organizations. They need to teach institutions such as all through uh, the core system best practices of how to uh, provide services to indigenous communities. So have they, they have, for the community themselves, they have developed the whole system of decolonization workshops. But for uh, service providers, they have developed what they call cultural sensitivity workshops. It sounds nicer, it doesn't sound as radical and revolutionary as decolonization workshop. It's the same thing, but it's couched in a very different language because also some of these nonprofit organizations can pay money to have these, uh, these trainings. And it's interesting, <coughs> the longest and more, most impactful trainings have been with the Los Angeles Police Department because five years ago there was a, a, a shooting and, and a Maya immigrant was killed in the streets because he was welding a knife. And these um, Mexican American officers came to the scene. They called him in Spanish to drop the knife, and uh, the Maya immigrant didn't comply and they killed him. And so they found out later that Spanish was not his primary language, and the police department wanted to learn more about uh, this population. So they invited. Uh, Leoncio Vasquez, who's a mixteco, who's the, who was the past executive director of Centro Binacional, Policarpo Chai, who's the director of Maya Vision that provides 
uh, interpretation services from uh, uh, about Mayan communities. And Olivia Romero, who's the current binational co coordinator of the binational indigenous front, and she's a Zapotec, and also she's a trained interpreter. And they're interpreting and uh, role playing with police officers. Uh, how can they interact with people that do not speak Spanish? And it's interesting because this is there the police who who came to this training initially. They said, "Well, it seems that these Indians don't understand me. If I speak loud and slowly, they understand my Spanish." And then Leoncio turned around and said, "Okay," and he starts speaking in Mixteco. So like, I'm speaking to you very slowly and very loudly in Mixteco. Because do you understand anything? And of course. Uh, you know, that opens a lot of possibilities. And now there's a whole set of police officers who are trained to uh, identify quickly if a person uh, of uh, Mexican or Guatemalan origin does not speak uh, Spanish. So sometimes it can be, here's Odilia with uh, officers and they're, you know, with their weapons here, so it's kind of intimidating, but they've been very successful actually um, in terms of doing that. And, um, and, and also there are uh, dozens of state agencies that are working with um, um, indigenous languages, for example, that they have a need <coughs> to understand issues of diversity, issues of language needs uh, within the um, indigenous community. So this is a, a workshop organized with um, um, the California Rural Legal Assistance, the Centro Binacional, and the um, and this is with the uh, County um, Agricultural Commission of Ventura County, because that's one of the places where a lot of indigenous migrants are concentrated. They say, what to do? We are, you know, what is going on here? How can we better understand these um, um, indigenous populations? Like that, the entire staff. And actually, the center is the director of the Agricultural uh, um, Commission in Metro County, who used to be an organizer with the United Farm Workers. And that's why he, he had the connections and he had the uh, sensibility to, to, to bring us to do, to do these trainings. And so I think that um, I want to use uh, start wrapping it up with the impact that this has had on of the second generation. Because uh, as I was saying, most of these indigenous immigrants come to the United States start coming in the mid-1990s. So by now, they have children. And these children then are also grappling with some of the questions. Who are we? And what is our role within the community? And I would guess that these young people were like providing with some answers. Right? How can you because this is the whole point about the indigenous movement. That you know, the whole spirit of that movement was that indigenous people want to be equal as anyone else, but also they want the right to be different, to maintain a sense of their own history, to maintain their language. And it seems like a contradiction, except when you start hearing some of these um, um, young people. And I want to play just to end, and I have a lot of um, uh, slides about uh, uh, Los Angeles, because Los Angeles has uh, declared the uh, Oaxacan Heritage Month. There's so many activities there, and you can see uh, all the different activities. And Olivia and is here, and the calendar of activities, how present and how public the presence of indigenous people are. Now we're mapping uh, 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 the presence of all these hometown associations, close to 80 hometown associations in Los Angeles, and we have. Uh, meetings with, with people. So all this uh, work is um, uh, in collaboration with, uh, with, um, with the community. Um, but I just want to end with, um, and I don't know, maybe you said you can help me to play this um, video. You know, look, look for it. Um, this one right here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you just click on it. Where's my Oh, 
okay, I need to see that. This is uh, Miguel Villegas. Actually, no, no, this is not him. Bro, what I will have to do is that you can see the people who know that. We are actually like, yes, go ahead. So this is Miguel Villegas, he's a, a young um, immigrant from uh, the Mesteca region. He came with, he's at one point um, generation, he came uh, when he was nine years old. His first language is Mixteco. He learned Spanish when he arrived to Fresno and started going to school, actually, in the United States. And then he learned English. Um, and he started by working in the fields, of course, like the, uh, his parents and his siblings. But also he realized that he, he, was, uh, he had a, a skill for poetry, actually. He started writing poetry. And then he started learning how to rap. And this is interesting because he has a performance where he comes into the scene uh, with his full gear of traditional Mixteco dancer. He wears a mask and he has his heavy jacket and he starts dancing with traditional music and as his uh, performance evolves, he starts shedding those clothes and by the end he's rapping in English, uh, you know, wearing the traditional clothes of a hobo. And so it's interesting because <laughs> People get very, some people love it, and some people sort of question him, right? Especially uh, some of the elders in the Mixteco community say, well, why do you act like this? We love it when you start, when you come with the, <laughs> with the mask and the traditional dance, and you start dancing with that traditional music, but then you change. Why is that? You know, we don't, we don't like it. And, and some of the young people, some of the hardcore rappers, are like, why are you doing wearing those masks? You know, those are our parents. You have to leave that behind. If he says that his proposal, and he has this rap, uh, mistake is not a dialect, it's a language. He said, well, this is who I am. And I have to embrace who I am and my experience in order to thrive. And I think that's the most wonderful message that you can give. And it's a message of liberation. Actually, so let's listen a little bit of it. And you can actually um, look for him. He has a lot of uh, videos, and, and his artistic name is Una Isu, and, um, um, uh, and, and and this is uh, one of the uh, a warrior in one of the codices. The mystic is the warrior of. Uh, uh, deer, uh, jaguar, uh, wearer. So it's interesting that he goes back to the um, 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 the college days. And just let's listen a little bit to to. Mm, I thought I could do. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Any questions? 
at the back and then here in the front. And you can shout your question so we can hear it. Yeah, I was wondering, so obviously so many indigenous people were killed during colonization in Mexico, but I'm wondering what like, specific differences between the U.S. and Mexican colonization led to there being so many millions of indigenous people in Mexico while in the U.S. the population is so small. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, it is... Uh, is historical about the presence, actually the density and concentration. Uh, the Native American population was very dispersed. Uh, they were not concentrated because of survival strategies, but also the role of the state. What was the role of the state? The, uh, there's a whole uh, literature on settler colonialism and how it was different in the United States and Mexico. And how important it is the role of the state in the face of the Native people in Canada, in the United States and Mexico. Um, the the strategy that the Spanish used is that they wanted uh, to conquer these indigenous people. They want battles, so they wanted to use them as cheap labor. So it was in their interest to maintain. And they had a whole system called encomiendas, where uh, Spaniards were allocated lands and people. So it was in their interest to maintain the population because they would do the work. And also the densities were uh, bigger, so that's, I think. But you need to look at the historical process of colonization, the role of the state, and see how different it is uh, in these three countries. That's a great question, and there's whole seminars on that. Here? Yeah? Um, yeah, uh, thank you for your presentation. That was amazing. Um, my question is, do you see that, uh, I can see that the Mexican indigenous community is very organized and Similar in, for example, like even like Bolivia and Mexico, and Peru. Do you notice that those communities are also have something similar going on, or is there like something like a point where you're doing that? Here in the United States. Yeah. So the question was whether or not all the indigenous communities from Latin America uh, were organizing as the Mexican communities uh, here in the United States, and. Um, Yes and no. And so something that you have to notice is that not all indigenous people from Mexico are organized. So we have large populations from Michoacán, uh, we have uh, Mayans from Chiapas, most of the organizations that we know are from Oaxaca. But also, yes, there are Bolivians, Quechua Bolivians all over the world, especially in New York. Mayans are very well organized in LA and um, uh, Florida. Um, and Bolivians do not migrate that much to the United States. They go to Argentina, Brazil, and Chile. Uh, but the other large community are Peruvians. And you find Peruvians actually very well organized around. Um, and the most well organized is the diaspora of uh, traditional Latin music. They're organized around those networks. Yeah. One last question before we go. Yeah. Visibility of indigenous people, especially in places like Mexico, is, is, is front and center. However, indigenous people are very diverse politically. So the idea that they would push in one direction, I think is ideal, but that's not the reality. Different people are, for example, responding to the policies of the current administration in different ways. Some of them are resistant, and some of them are responsive. So the response has been a variety of uh, political positions, but we need to watch that in that very Thank you so much. Paper, pass it that way. I like the way we'll get it. Thank you very much, CB, for filming. Yeah. Uh, for putting us people around.